Um, I gave this talk a couple of years ago, and the reason I was shaking my head when Kim called it a legislative update is it's actually a policy primer. I'm going to give you um, a talk that may explain some of the things Catherine told you about that might have been a bit um, obscure or just complicated for you. Um, I think it's a, an area that a lot of activists, just by the, what we call you, we call you activists, you are folks who are very actively protesting this practice, but you're not necessarily biologists, you're not necessarily policy experts, and so our job as biologists and policy experts is to um, help you understand you know, how the government works, which is really nobody understands how the government works, but we try. Um, and it's what we have to work with. These are the tools we have to work with. So I'm going to try to explain to you some of these things. This is all mostly US based. And um, if you have any questions at the end, of course, I'll help, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll respond. But um, this is just meant to help you understand how the government approaches this, these issues. And if you sometimes are frustrated by the lack of movement or the lack of change, you are going to understand why, hopefully, by the end of this talk. So there are some statutes that we're working with here in the United States. So we're working with the Marine Mammal Protection Act um, in, in the US. One of the reasons why things are more difficult in Canada is because they don't have a Marine Mammal Protection Act. Most countries do not have a Marine Mammal Protection Act. Some do, most don't. And the reason it's important, the reason why most countries should have Marine Mammal Protection Acts is because marine mammals, unlike terrestrial mammals, mammals are just a lot harder to deal with. They live in the ocean. We're terrestrial mammals ourselves. It's hard to get into their world. And so the bottom line is they need more precautionary protection. Because a lot of things can happen below the surface of the water before we even know it, before science knows it. And so a lot of damage can be done before science can tell you, policymakers, anybody, the media, that the damage has in fact been done. And so we need precautionary management of human behavior and the animals to protect them. And that's why a Marine Mammal Protection Act is necessary. And there's just too many countries that don't have them, but in fact, the US does. And I hope you noticed that this was passed in 1972. Who was president then? Richard Nixon. Okay? We can be bipartisan about this. We don't have to always like be blue and red. You know, there is some cooperation is possible here. I just don't know where that went in this country, but you know, Richard Nixon was president when this law was passed. He was also president. He was also president when the Endangered Species Act was passed. And OSHA and the EPA. There you go. Um, again, yeah, ESA. The National Environmental Policy Act is a statute that determines procedure, process. And again, you'd be surprised at how important that is. Half of the very successful lawsuits you may read about in the news are actually NEPA cases, not MMPA or ES, ESA cases, or not solely MMPA or ESA cases. They are actually NEPA cases because the government didn't do it right. And when the government doesn't do it right, they lose these lawsuits. Procedural lawsuits are the ones that succeed more often by far than merit cases focused on these environmental statutes, just so you understand that. I also want to point out that the MMPA does not have a citizen suit provision. You have no automatic right to file a suit under the MMPA because you see a violation of the law. You being an NGO, a citizen, you know, a citizen group. You do not have an automatic right under the law to sue under the MMPA. However, the ESA does have a citizen supervision. So you have an automatic right, just as a citizen of the United States of America, to sue the government because they broke the law. To sue a corporation because they broke the law. The law being ESA, not MMP. So generally speaking, when you're trying to sue under um, the MMPA, you have to sue under the Administrative Procedures Act as well as the MMPA. Both of them have to sort of be involved in the lawsuit. The Administrative Procedures Act is similar to NEPA in that it is a process, procedural statute. Basically tells the government how they have to behave 
when they're pursuing things. So NEPA basically tells the government you have to do a full environmental assessment. You have to assess the impacts of your action, whether it's issuing a permit or allowing you know, the Navy to perform sonar exercises, whatever it might be. If you're gonna allow that as the government, you have to follow certain environmental assessment procedures before you let it go forward. You have to assess whether it's gonna have a negative impact. That's what NEPA requires. The Administrative Procedures Act, just, and it, I'm, it's gonna sound like I'm oversimplifying it, but it's pretty simple, in, 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 which is an odd thing in, in any kind of US government policy, or any government policy for that matter. It's a pretty simple thing. You can't behave in an arbitrary and capricious manner. That's the, that's the standard. You can't just say, I'm gonna do this. That's a monarchy or a dictatorship. They actually are required to justify what they do. If they don't adequately justify what they do, then you can file a suit under the APA because of a violation of the MMPA and go from there. And then that other statute, the Animal Welfare Act, we all know that perhaps best in this room because it's the um, uh, statute that protects the animals that are in captivity. It was passed in 1966. It was, you know, it was, it was state of the art at the time, but it's now very old fashioned in the sense that it's extremely difficult to sue under that statute because of the weak way it's written. And again, it has no citizen supervision and even um, more telling, unlike the MMPA, which is clearly intended to protect these animals from human action, the AWA is really the Industry Welfare Act and it's really written more to protect industry than it is the animals. And not only don't you have any automatic right to sue under it, but you also don't have an automatic standing under it. So in courts, you have to show that you have a right to be there representing the plaintiff, which may be you, for example. You may be the plaintiff. You're suing the government because they broke the law. Under the AWA, you do not have automatic standing to bring a suit on behalf of, for example, Lolita. You, you do not have the right, the court's just gonna say, well, you know, what, what right do you have to sue on behalf of this whale? You know, you're not the whale's mother, you're not the whale's owner. You're not going to be harmed if anything happens to this whale. Now you could argue, yes I am, I'm going to be harmed because you know, I'm not gonna be able to sleep at night and you know, it's gonna ruin my life and all that, but you know, that's a hard argument to make to a judge. So it has been very difficult to get standing under the AWA for any lawsuit, for chimpanzees, for anything, but certainly for these animals in public display facilities. It's been extremely difficult. One of the things that Lolita has now, which makes her a very different situation, is she's now protected under the ESA. She's the only whale in captivity who is protected under the ESA. And that, that gives her something that she didn't have before. And then, there's, and then there's the Lacey Act, which basically says you can't move these animals across state lines, which happens every time they're moved from one facility to another in another state. You can't do that if they were acquired illegally. So for example, that means that um, if an animal was originally captured against the law in Mexico or somewhere else, it's now in the U.S. and has been for years. You can't move them across state lines. However, whatever happened back in the 60s or 70s or 80s that allowed that to happen, now you can't move them across state lines. And this is true for anything. This is, if you acquired rattlesnakes illegally in Arizona, you can't move them to California. California may have state laws saying you can't do it, but the federal law will also not allow you to do it. And it was actually originally written to keep people from um, moving um, young women across state lines in sexual slavery. This is back in the 19th century. But it has since been expanded to include the movement of any living creature or dead or the product of a dead creature that was acquired illegally in the place of origin, whether it's a state or another country, etc. And I'm not a lawyer, so I've probably been getting some of this wrong, so don't don't hold me to any of this. But uh, these are these are the things that I've heard, learned over the years and 23 years of talking to a lot of lawyers. Um, now there's treaties and agreements, international ones, that we also work with, and Catherine mentioned some of these. She mentioned CITES, all right? The Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, or CITES, and that's CITES, not CITES, um, is 
probably the biggest environmental treaty. It has over 180 countries, and there really aren't very many more than 200 countries in existence, so this has over 180 countries that are parties to it. But as Catherine pointed out, there are different levels of CITES, Appendix 1, Appendix 2, and Appendix 3. And if you're on Appendix 2, as most whales and dolphins are, and pretty much all whales and dolphins in live international trade, not all of them, but almost all of them, in live international trade, you're on Appendix 2. If you're on Appendix 2, trade is legal. International trade is legal. But it's monitored. And the way it's monitored is by um, the, the country of origin assessing that it's not going to be detrimental to move this animal in trade. So that's called a non-detriment finding. And um, you need to issue an export permit from the country of origin so you can monitor it. So it's in a system where you can keep track. You only need an import permit, again, as Catherine pointed out, if, one, you're on Appendix 1, then you need an import permit as well. Or if the country of, rec of receipt, in this case, say, coming from Russia to the United States, U.S. has the Marine Mammal Protection Act. We can have a domestic statute that requires stricter regulations than the treaty itself. You can't have weaker regulations than the treaty has set into place, but you can have stricter regulations. And the U.S. is one of those countries that does. So it's how we stop the import from Russia of those 18 belugas that were coming to Georgia Aquarium. Not by CITES. Russia hands out non-detriment findings like candy. They don't care. Um, and that's the problem. If you want to challenge a non-detriment finding, finding, you're basically saying, Russia, you're a liar. Well, let's just start World War III over that. You know, they're not going to take kindly to that. It can cause an international incident. And so countries are reluctant to call other countries on their non-detriment findings. It's a, it's a difficult problem. It's a diplomatic problem. But we didn't have to do that. We didn't even have to address Russia's non-detriment finding. We had the MMPA that had certain standards that Georgia Aquarium had to meet to allow the animals to be imported, and they did not meet those standards. So the permit was denied just because they didn't meet those standards. Georgia Aquarium sued because they believed that NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, blund you know, blundered in that regard, and the court did not agree with Georgia Aquarium. The court agreed with NOAA. Does that make sense? World Trade Organization, for all of you folks here who know who Ben White was, you know, he wore that turtle suit at the WTO protests. Fabulous stuff. I mean, that's the kind of you know, street theater you, know, you just aren't going to see again. Um, it unfortunately basically allows certain um, trade that is, in my opinion, harmful to the environment just because you can't stop world trade. You can't stop world trade. Of course you could, but you know, the, the world is now based on the free movement of goods and, and services across borders. A lot of these agreements, the, Na the North American Free Trade Agreement, the European Union, the European Commission is all based on you know, the idea that free trade is, is the way to go. And so unfortunately, a lot of things, including the, the, the dolphin safe tuna thing, was challenged under this treaty. You can't say you can't sell your tuna in the United States just because you're harming a bunch of dolphins. That's what the WTO rule. Convention on Biological Diversity, the US isn't a party to this. But it is, it is a fairly decent statute. It does a lot of things that help protect biological diversity, but the US isn't a party to it. Why not? Why not? Oh, I wish I knew the answer to that question. Probably more sovereignty issues, right? They, they were very reluctant about becoming a member of WTO. All of these sovereignty questions. We are a sovereign nation, and we need to keep control of our sovereign interests. And treaties can challenge that. And the Convention on Biological Diversity, for some reason, reaches that level for the State Department. The Convention on Migratory Species, same thing. We're not a party to that in the US. And there are um, regional and bilateral agreements under some of these bigger treaties. ASCABANS is um, a CMS regional agreement. ACOBAMS is a regional uh, CMS agreement. The Cartagena Convention or the SPA Protocol. The SPA Protocol, which is especially protected areas and wildlife in the Caribbean, is part of the larger Cartagena Convention. All right? The, the um, Ascobans is in the um, North Sea and the Baltic, and Aquabams is in the Mediterranean Sea and the Black Sea. 
So these are regional agreements that are under the CMS agreement that, in this case, for Azkabans and Akabans, specifically protect cetaceans. So in fact, in the European Union, they're doing a slightly better job, not a great job, but a slightly better job than we are in protecting certain areas of the world against sort of free trade or too much trade or too much exploitation. In the United States, we have the U.S. Department of Commerce. This is where it gets really confusing, by the way, and it's all because of history. It's all because of precedent set years ago before you were born. You know, it, 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 it makes no sense. So don't expect it to. Um, the U.S. Department of Commerce has the National Marine Fisheries Service, also known as NOAA Fisheries. Are you getting why I called this alphabet soup? No. Uh, NMFS is pronounced NIMS, like the little water nymphs, you know, in, in, the, in your rivers and streams. So NIMS, um, also known as NOAA Fisheries, um, is responsible for the MMPA. This is the agency that we're all writing to when we're um, protesting the import of 18 Russian blueberries, for example. They are responsible for administering the MMPA, the ESA when it comes to cetaceans and pinnipeds, the MMPA when it comes to cetaceans and pinnipeds, and CITES when it comes to cetaceans and pinnipeds, except for the walrus. <laughs> Back in 1972, the Fish and Wildlife Service was responsible for walruses, polar bears, sirenians, manatees and dugongs, and sea otters. And so when the MMPA and the ESA were passed, they just kept that jurisdiction, and NOAA got everything else. Makes no sense at all. And it doesn't make any sense to the agencies either. <laughs> the US Department of Interior, which is really where NOAA should be. The Department of Interior is the equivalent of the Department of, or Ministry of Environment in most other countries. It's the, the department that's responsible for the environment of the United States. So it would make more sense than the Commerce Department for the agency that's responsible for protecting these animals to be in the Department of Interior, they just aren't. It's not commonsensical, it makes no sense at all. So again, Fish and Wildlife Service is the agency that administers the same statutes. I put them in different order because, because they're more responsible for the ESA because there's so many more terrestrial mammals and other fish, butterflies, plants that are protected by the ESA on land than are in the marine environment. And so Fish and Wildlife Service end, ends up doing most of the ESA work, but NOAA does some ESA stuff. Um, again, same thing with CITES. They are the agency that we domestically appointed to administer all of our CITES obligations under that treaty. We, we designated Fish and Wildlife Service to do that. And they are only responsible for those four taxa I mentioned. Walruses, sirenians, mantis and dugongs, sea otters and polar bears under the MMPA. So they get loud, you know, that's the five listed at last. Whereas the Department of Commerce is responsible for every other marine mammal, so that's their first responsibility. And again, it makes no sense. Please do not spend one moment of time trying to make sense out of it. <laughs> Department of Agriculture, now suddenly when a marine mammal moves into a public display facility, it becomes a cow, it becomes livestock. Although, actually, just to further confuse you, livestock are not protected under the animal welfare. <laughs> Seriously. Animals we eat in the United States are not protected under the AWA. There are separate statutes that protect them. But, for example, what, what, what I mean by that is simply that when you cross the border of, of a public display facility when you're a whale or a dolphin, you immediately become a terrestrial mammal. Because the Department of Agriculture suddenly becomes responsible for you. The MMPA's jurisdiction stops right at the gate. And that didn't used to be the case. In 1994, they shared jurisdiction, but that ended in 94. So there's the agencies, the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, or again, the acronym is APHIS, and they administer the AWA. Memorize this slide. <laughs> it will make a lot of very confusing stuff you read in the media, et cetera, make some sense, not a lot. When you have a statute, it has certain language in it. And sometimes it's very specific and sometimes it's very, very general. The more general the statute, the worse it can be for us and the animals. Because the more generalized and sort of big picture, 30,000 foot the language is in the statute, the easier it is to interpret it however you please. 
and the agencies are responsible for interpreting the statute and formulating regulations. If we don't like the way the agencies interpret those, that language in the statute, we can sue and the court will interpret it on its own. So in fact, the court can change the law, not the language of the statute, that's Congress's job, but it can change the interpretation of the language. The agency starts with the interpretation. If we don't like it, we sue, the court will then interpret it. Language remains the same, but if it's vague enough, it can be interpreted every which way from Sunday. The more specific statutory language is, the better. And if you remember, I told you the AWA it was written a long time ago and it's pretty general. That is why it's very, again, one more reason why it's very difficult to sue under. The MMPA, on the other hand, is far more specific. It makes it easier to interpret, and that's why we win more lawsuits when we file um, particularly procedural lawsuits under. So what's going on in these regulations? So you start with a statute. It may have general or specific language, but regardless, it needs to be interpreted. So you write regulations, you being the agency, you write regulations to interpret. So if you're told under statute that you have to keep animals healthy, you then write a regulation that specifies how that will come about. So this is the nuts and bolts of what the zoo or aquarium has to do to keep that animal healthy. This is where the, you only have to keep an orca in a tank that's 48 feet wide and 12 feet deep comes from. That'll keep them healthy, not, but you see, that's what they did way back when, they interpreted it that way. They wrote a regulation like that. Now, of course, we're very, very actively trying to change that. Because, believe it or not, they are considering revising those regulations. They are in the process of considering that. <laughs> and so they are going to either conclude they don't have to revise them, which I think we might even have a lawsuit there, even though the AWA is difficult to sue under. Standing will then again be the issue. Or they are going to revise them. God knows what they'll revise them to. But they interpreted those standard, the, the language of the statute, I don't know, 30 years ago now, 35 years ago or so, and now they're finally in the process of updating, even though, of course, we've had a lot of science for a long time to say that these standards aren't adequate. So there was a proposed rule in the Federal Register, and this is, this is the part of my talk where I urge you all to pay attention to these things when groups like mine alert you to them. This is your chance to participate in your government. We do, in fact, although it's hard to believe sometimes, live in a democracy. And you as a citizen have the right and the power to participate in your government. This is how you do it. The Federal Register alerts the public every day of the year to the actions the US government is taking on every statute that it has. It is thousands of pages long by the end of every year. It is ludicrous, really, how complicated our government can be. But there it is, it's your opportunity, and it's our job as NGOs to distill it for you. And every time you get an action alert and we say write a letter, that's what we're doing. We're saying write a letter because the US government just told us in the Federal Register they're about to do something stupid. It's almost certainly something stupid. <laughs> every once in a while it's something good, like the decision to deny the permit for to import the 18 Belugas. That was a good decision, we like that one. It's very rare that we have a good day like that. <laughs> We let you know that's what the government has decided to do. They have to propose it because you have the right to comment on it. It's a public process. Don't take that lightly. It can be taken away with you, from you with a stroke of a pen. Congress decides to change the law. But right now, you have the right to comment on that. It's a public process. You get 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, depends. You comment, and then they have to take account of those comments. They have to actually go through the process of reading those comments and telling you, again, in the Federal Register, why they accepted or didn't accept every substantive comment that was offered. So this proposed rule by APHIS on the animal care and maintenance standards for marine mammals, it's going to take a while because they got 9,000 or something like that. Maybe that's for the blue report. I don't remember how many. 5,000. 5,000 comments, about 100 of which were substantive. 
So they're going to have to go through those 100 substantive comments and remark and, and tell you why they accepted or didn't accept every single one of them. Does that make sense? So that was our comment. When you, when you say they have to tell you, that's a general statement that, that they plan for? Or? So the Federal Register will in fact, uh, <coughs> I can't go back, I don't know how. Um, the the uh, Federal Register will publish the decision of APIS on their proposed rule, whether they decide to make it final or whether they decided to revise it. No matter what their decision is, they have to recount every single substantive comment and tell you, the U.S. citizen, why they made that decision to accept or not accept this substantive comment. They actually have to distill every comment they got down to its essence, make a list of those, and then say whether they accepted or didn't accept them and why. The final rule, regardless of whether they decide to revise the standards or keep them the same or whatever it is they decide to do, is hundreds of pages long, long for that reason, when they're making a major action like this, when they're making a, a major rule like this. So when you say substance, I'm not sure I have the word right. Substantive. It's so when I'm saying, for example, if you say the reason you need to have the, uh, uh, an orca enclosure be bigger than 48 feet across and 12 feet deep is because blah, 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 the science says this and the science says that. It really needs to be 100 feet long or 300 feet long or 1,000 feet long and blah, blah, deep. That's what I said to you, and I gave you some scientific research to support my claim that that's why you need to do that. APHIS is going to have to tell me why they did or didn't accept that. But if everybody wrote the same exact... They only have to reply to that substantive idea once. Okay. So when you write a form letter, I don't want to discourage you from writing form letters in response to these kinds of actions, but they only have to respond once. What? 5,000 letters that all say the same thing tells the agency is that people are watching them. And they need to understand that. They're not doing this in a vacuum. And they're not going to get away with anything. We're all watching. But they don't have to respond to the same comment 5,000 times. They only have to re respond to 5,000 people making the same comment once. Does that make sense? That's my point. We don't want to do that. No, no, no. For, again, I do not want to discourage form letters. Writing the same letter over and over and over again has an influence on the agency. They don't have to respond to every single one, but it does tell them, for example, if they get out of that 5,000, 2,000 from us and 2,000 from the industry and they're both form letters, well, you know, all that really tells them is, you know, they, you know, yes, they sort of canceled, but everybody's watching, including the industry. Everybody's watching. It, it, it puts some pressure on them to be up on their game. It's not a worthless gesture to respond to those action words. I do not want to discourage you from doing that. But if you can add in some science and add in some substance and think outside the box, all the better. Um, my letter was about 70 pages long. It was co-signed by a whole bunch of people in this room. Um, it had, I don't remember now, but a lot of references, 135 references or something like that, um, which I pr provided every single one to APHIS because I didn't want them to say, oh, we couldn't find it anywhere, so I gave it to them. Um, so they are going to have to, because that was all substantive. I hope I didn't blah, blah my way through any part of it. And they're going to have to respond to everything I said. That's what I do. If you really want to know what I do for a living, that's what I do. I'm a scientist. I'm one of the rare path or, or hybrid breeds that decided to go from science into policies. A terrible, I am basically a lawyer now. And, and I've been told by lawyers, I thought you were a lawyer because of the way I talk. And that wasn't a compliment in my mind, but, um, <laughs> but that is what I do. I took my science background and moved into policy. So I understand the animals and why this policy isn't good for them, or why this policy would be good for them. Whereas a regular policy person, just a lawyer, and I don't mean to denigrate lawyers, lawyers oh, I just did, didn't I? <laughs> um, but I don't. I work a lot with lawyers, they're very, very important, 
half the lawsuits we file have some of the most fantastic lawyers, the other half maybe not, um, and, and they do a, an incredible job. And they understand the law, which I do not necessarily. Like I said, I'm, sometimes I'm talking through my hat when I talk about some of these statutes. But I tell the lawyers why this regulation, this proposed regulation might not be appropriate. Because biologically, it's just not gonna do it for these animals. So that's what a policy person does. And if you don't have the biological background, you just have to do a lot of good research and, and get up to speed and feel, and feel comfortable with the information. But you know, you're never gonna have quite that same impact as somebody who studied the animals and actually has spent time with them and knows them and their biology. So lawyers are always looking for experts. They're always looking for experts. And the more experts who understand policy, the better. That's what I'm trying to say to all my scientific colleagues. You've got to understand policy, and vice versa. Naomi? Yeah. Is that letter available anywhere? That yes, it's on the AWI it? website. And when do they have to respond to it? There's really no deadline. Okay. <laughs> Which means that we could be here five years from now, and I could still be talking about that proposed rule. Wow. In the meantime, don't worry. Oh, okay, let me, let me give you an example just to... Just to this again, this is my life. You're about to hear about my life. It took them 20 years to propose this rule. I have been doing this for 23 years. In 1996, we finished a process where within two years they should have proposed a rule, and we waited 20. Welcome to the United States of America. <laughs> or any government. Seriously, it's true for every government. I think that kind of goes without saying. <laughs> I mean, really, we waited 20 years for crap, which was really, really offensive to me because I've been here the whole time and I waited 20 years for that. And I pretty much started my letter that way. And, and if you read my letters, which I think some of you have, if you read the stuff I write, I don't really hesitate to say, really? Really, I waited 20 years for this. And Naomi's letter, I have to say, because um, I edited an early version and I had to do no editing. Naomi's letter is better than the proposed rule by a million and if they took her letter and they made that the proposed rule, these animals would actually get some dignity in where they are now. Yeah. yeah. So thank you. And, and that, this is, my, my goal is not to make everything okay for having these animals in captivity. You understand that, you know, obviously there's that risk. If you actually be part of the process, then you're sort of endorsing the practice. I made it very clear right at the head of the letter because I knew who I was getting signed. We do not want these animals in captivity, period. But they're not all going to be set free tomorrow. All right? We need to care about these animals in the meantime. We need to care for these animals in the meantime. And so until we empty the tanks, you gotta do better, dudes. <laughs> you know, that's really all my letter said. And here's how I think you can do it better. If that makes sense. I'm not endorsing public display. I'm telling you that until you end it, you being society and you being the government and you being whoever, until the stock falls so far that you gotta close or whatever, until you empty the tanks, here's the very least we have to do for these animals. And I made, it because the AWA sets minimum standards, minimum standards, not maximum, minimum standards. I kept saying over and over and over again, this is the least we need to do to make these animals not suffer every day of their lives. Because right now, they are suffering every day of their lives. And if you do what I say, they'll still be suffering, but a hell of a lot less. That's all it was, this is what this is all about. This is what policy is all about. We're both trying to change the laws to end harmful practices and change regulations to mitigate harmful practices. And then we're just trying to change society, which will change the laws themselves. While we're working with the laws we're working with, that's policy, that's what I do. I also work on trying to change policy, which is the next part, legislation. I'm actually trying to change the laws, because quite frankly, some of our laws really are worth nothing. They're not worth the paper they're printed on. And the AWA is sort of in that category. But it could be another 20 years. You waited 20 years for this, you wrote a letter, it could be another 20. Years. Welcome to my world. <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably have to change 
Okay, so um, I want some credit, goddammit, for not having quit way before this. <laughs> And a lot of people are quick. <laughs> so, you know, and I thought about it a couple of times, but you know, I'm not dead yet. So, um, legislation, we can change state law in the United States and federal law. That's what AB 2305 or HB 2888, anybody familiar with that statute here in Washington State? That was a bill that was proposed to change state law. Um, or federal law, and we have a, a federal uh, bill also. So H.R. 4019 is a federal bill that was proposed by Adam Schiff and um, Jared Huffman to outlaw the public display of orcas. And it would end the breeding. It would do exactly what the corporate policy that SeaWorld has announced would do, but it would be codified in law. And that's important because corporate policy can change with the next CEO. We do not want Joel Manby to be fired. I'm not kidding. You do not want Joel Manby to be fired. So every time you gloat over the fact that the uh, SeaWorld stock is now 15, um, think about that. He's going to be fired soon if something doesn't happen, and I think that would be bad. Right? They don't have a lot of other options. I hope not. <laughs> so. The, the, the federal statute, this federal bill, sorry, it's not a statute yet, unfortunately, but the federal bill um, would turn SeaWorld's corporate policy into um, law. And again, that's good and important because corporate policy can change. Um, unfortunately, as you all know from our wonderful electoral process, um, <laughs> the US uh, Congress is completely and utterly dysfunctional. <laughs> it's just utterly dysfunctional. So they're not, it's not moving, I'm just telling you that. We are working on it, we're lobbying, we're visiting offices, and this again is part of what I do. I live just behind the Capitol. I don't live just behind the Capitol, I work just behind the Capitol, I live out in Virginia. But I, I work right behind the Capitol, and so we go to the Hill and lobby these offices to support this bill. Whether it will ever get a hearing or whether it will ever be voted on, write to your congressmen, please, write to your senators, tell them that you want them to support this bill. We'll see whether it moves. Again, that's the bill right there. It is not had a hearing. But that's what, where we're at right now. We're trying to get it heard in committee. If it passes committee, it would go to the floor. That's just in the House of Representatives. It would then need a companion bill in the Senate. Okay. California AB 2305, this is a legislative update. It's the only bit that is. Um, so in California, we have this bill. It was the uh, reincarnation of AB 2140 which was introduced in 2014. It is on the fast track, which means it's kind of moving through certain procedural channels that are very arcane. I won't get into them, but they're not the standard, you know, hearing and committee um, uh, vote on the floor. So it, is, it has passed the assembly, which is the equivalent of the House of Representatives. It is being discussed in the Senate, and we're hoping that by August it will be law. But I will you know, be posting stuff on my Facebook page, and AWY will be posting stuff on its um, website and to keep people updated on the progress of that bill. We are, the po we are the sponsors of this bill. In California, citizens groups are sponsors of bills. The legislator is the author of the bill. And so we are the sponsor of this bill, AWI, and so we will know if and when it moves, and we'll let you know. Who knows who these young ladies are? They're just amazing. This is Kira Kotler who um, was a Mal is a Malibu young lady. She's from Malibu and her sister and a good friend of hers. This is in 2014. You know, sh that big protest that Rachel showed in um, Malibu, I bet you Dollars and Donuts College were there. Um, they did an amazing job of helping us lobby when it was 2140. Um, and they were very supportive of 2305 as well, but they didn't actually have, there was, it wasn't necessary for them to come to uh, Sacramento for 2305, but they were very helpful with 2140. And uh, they were the ones who charmed, you know, the bejesus out of the then chair of the committee, who was extremely supportive of this bill. He's now the speaker of the assembly. It's why the bill is moving ahead so rapidly. Um, it passed the assembly committee like that because He's now the Speaker of the Assembly. 
He's no longer the chair of the committee, but he's now the speaker of the assembly, which is way more powerful, and he likes this bill very much. I just want to tell you that um, the Cotler family, they're the host of Malibu event. So, so the Cotler family is the host of the Malibu event. Not surprised at all. Fantastic people. So this is 2305 era, so this is this year. That's Richard Bloom on the left, and it's Jennifer Fearing, our lobbyist, on the right. And all of the orcas that they gave away to all of the legislators to ask them for support. For some stupid reason, politicians love plushy toys. And, and if you hand one out to them, they'll vote for you. Oh my god, you know, there's something so wrong with that. And that's us on the day we testified. That's John Hargrove on the left, that's myself on the right, and Richard Bloom in the middle. And so we actually um, went to testify as we did in 2014. We testified in 2016. It was a lot less problematic. I mean, it was nasty in 2014. We were called names, we were insulted. Seawold was there and very nasty. But now, in 2016, they actually quietly supported this bill. And the only reason we could figure, and we didn't really get into it too deeply because we didn't want to you know, look a gift horse in the mouth, but in the mouth, but the reason we figured that they were quietly, very quietly supportive of this bill is because they wanted it codified in law so people would get off their back, right? They don't want you to keep questioning whether they're really serious about this policy. Apparently they are, at least in California, I'm not so sure about Texas and, and Florida, but they're very serious about this policy in California. They want people to come back to the park, they want people to get off their back, and so they were very quietly supportive of 2305. So, we didn't need the cobblers, although we would have loved to have had them. We didn't need a celebrity. We didn't need, you know, extra. And Giles, who you all met now here at this event, Giles came in, in 2014 to testify in our, on our behalf, but she didn't have to come in 2016. It was much quieter and easier, and, and whoosh, it went right through the committee. Here in Washington, you had HB 2888. Um, it did not proceed. It did not progress. It did get a hearing, but it didn't progress. We have, um, how many of you take, uh, which, Anna, what, which airline does she fly for? Kenmore Air. Kenmore Air. How many of you fly Kenmore Air? Well, Anna D'Arietta, um, Anna Gulickson, is um, a pilot for Kenmore Air. And again, you citizens have an enormous amount of power. Look what Rachel's done. Look what people can do. Anna just said, you know what? This was at one of the super pods. She said, you know what? Even though there are no more orcas in, in Washington State, even though there are no more cetaceans in captivity in Washington State, it all kind of started here and we should end it here, so let's pass a bill. And so she went to a senator who flew her plane. She was the pilot for a particular state senator, and she went to him and said, would you sponsor a bill? And he said, yeah, sure. <laughs> the Super Pac 3, she came and met with you. Exactly. And so she is going to keep trying. She's going to do this year after year after year until it finally passes. And she's doing it all in her own time and dying. This is just something she's really, really committed to. She's a single citizen. She's going to pass this bill. All right, so you can do that. If anybody is here from Florida or Texas, I want to talk to you. Bye. Bye. I want to talk. So again, we, we supported HB 2888. I came in to, um, to where is it? Sorry, Olympia, to, um, to uh, testify. Again, it didn't, it, didn't, it didn't progress. It failed. Okay, but we're gonna try again. Florida? Texas? <laughs> I wanna talk? <laughs> Internationally, what are we doing? Um, in Antigua and Barbuda, she, uh, we have a great activist named Mar Martha Jokes who's trying to get a statute passed in Antigua and Barbuda to outlaw captivity of, of, of dolphins. She had a facility there, they blocked a drain, and it all backed up into that lagoon there, and then, it, 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 because that brown water kept seeping into the dolphin facility. The dolphin facility is here. Mm -hmm. And all that brown water used to just come around and, and mess up their, um, their enclosures. So they blocked the drain illegally, <laughs> just to keep all of that brown water in the lagoon there, which then backed up onto the road <laughs> and into people's restaurants and homes. And <laughs> so they, get, they, they were told to leave country. And so because of all of that, she said, you know what, we need a statute that will actually keep them out of the country. And, and so she's pursuing that. Sorry about that. China. Um, China. So I don't know what we can do in China, but we now have a coalition. We have um, 
about eight groups now that are members of this coalition. Several of them are in China, mainland China. One is in Hong Kong and the rest are international. AWI is a member, WDC is a member, Marine Connection is a member. And we are going to continue our public awareness raising campaign, but at some point, hopefully there will be legislation. That's the goal. And let's face it, China is a totalitarian government, so if they decide to pass a statute, it shall be passed. So this is us launching the coalition in December of last year. This is in Beijing. Um, the folks on the right of me, uh, on my left, but on the right of the photograph, are um, all Chinese nationals who are we are working with in China. And um, again, there's about three or four of us in the international community, and we launched our campaign in December. So we're in early days now, quite young as a coalition and a, and a campaign, and we're just going to continue to work on public awareness raising. We have a website. We have a Weibo account. Weibo is the Chinese equivalent of Facebook. They block Facebook in China, which I find very charming because, of course, you can get around that. You know, they don't block anything in China. They think they do, but they don't really. Which is good. I mean, it means our, our ideas will continue to seep into the country. But um, they do block Facebook. And so um, if you don't know the ways around it, you have to go with Weibo, which is this pretty similar. And so we have a Weibo account. Um, we're growing the number of followers every day. You know, it's a public awareness raising campaign with the ultimate goal of getting some support in the government to pass. The situation in China is very, very grim. The Convention on International Trade, I described that already about the non-detriment finding. It's supposed to be based on scientific principles, but far too often it's just made up. It's literally made up. It's, it's based on nothing. And again, the problem with challenging another country's on detriment finding is you might start, an, you might cause an international incident, basically calling them liars. Nobody wants to do that because they don't want us to have an international incident. Diplomacy and politics, international politics. You know. um, it's actually very common, as we all have been hearing. Um, we all know about all of the carriers that move these animals around. Um, it's very lucrative. With these invalid NDFs, it really means that trade's unregulated. It, the, the, the places where it's most strongly regulated are those countries that pass stronger laws than CITES requires, like the US. So domestic trade is virtually hidden. A lot of the beliefs that are coming out of the Sea of Okhotsk never get recorded because they're sold within Russia. They're moving around Russia. They live and they die in these tiny little tanks in Russia. And so we have no idea what their numbers are. We have some vague idea of the numbers in international trade because of sightings, but we have no idea what the domestic trade is. The IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, has various species, speci species specialist groups. The um, cetacean specialist group has actually made this statement. This is a group of researchers, biologists, academics, government biologists, who have no, not a radical bone in their body, they're not activists, but they've made this statement because it's factually true. It's, it's, it's biologically true. When you remove an animal alive for public display, you might as well be killing it, because as far as the animals that are left behind are concerned, it died. It was taken off. To heaven. You know, they, don't, they don't know any better. It's gone. This animal's gone. This mother, this daughter, this child's gone. And it will never contribute its genes to the population. So as an environmental, ecological, biological matter, it is, has no value anymore. So when the industry tells you they've got all this conservation stuff going on and it's all about conservation, think about that. These animals no longer have any conservation value. And it can become a serious threat to local populations. Live capture can become a serious threat to local populations because of that. And very often they don't do the science that even is necessary to start with determining a sustainable level of removal. So unless you do that science, which is very rarely done, then you, know, you can't say whether it's a sustainable removal level or not. So if you're telling us in a non-detriment finding that it is sustainable, you are lying. 
but we don't want to tell you that because we don't want to start World War III. It's just, it's just a, a, it's, the policy arena is kind of soul destroying. It's really hard to work in the policy arena. Um, I come to events like this to sort of renew my soul because it's really hard to be a policy person in wildlife protection. Uh, that, that's, that's written over my head. It's really hard to be a policy person in wildlife protection. Um, so just a, a real quick rundown. This, I'm getting near the end here. Um, the last dolphin captures in the United States were in 89 and 93. 89 was the last bottlenose dolphin capture. 93 was the last Pacific. Other species, it was white-sided dolphins in California. Uh, 92 was the last international captures for out of Canada. In other words, all the blues started coming from Russia after 92 because they stopped exporting them after, after that. Um, as we know, Taiji, um, the Caribbean, the Sea of Okoks, these are live captures. Obviously, there's hunts in many other locations, but these are the live captures. Um, these are the beluga captures. Born to be Free is now in the film festival circuit. It has footage of these captures and it will shock you. I've seen the full film now and it really is worse than I thought and I thought it was really bad. And that's where they go, they go to China. <coughs> Lots of touching, they're really into like hugging, kissing and touching these animals and they don't live very long. One of the reasons the trade out of the Sea of Okok is just so steady is because they just have to constantly go back and get more. They're not breeding them in the captivity, they don't know how, and they're not giving them enough room to do it anyway, and they're dying. And so they just have to keep going back. They are, there's no real captive breeding going on in China or Russia. No significant captive breeding. Occasional birds, the calf might survive. Most of the time they die if they even give birth at all. Most of the time they don't even give birth, they don't conceive, or they miscarry. So there's no captive breeding going on. Every new whale and dolphin that comes into the system in China and Russia is probably coming from the wild. And they are building new facilities in China all the time. So think about that. It's a conveyor belt. So that's it. What about the facilities in the states of the Arizona? Those are going to be captive bred dolphins. We can't with captive bred dolphins. Again, the MMPA is strong, but not that strong. So what we need to do is just public pressure, business, attack the business. It's a bad business model. You're not going to make any money. It's going to collapse. You're going to invest all this money, and it's all going to fall, fall apart on you. It's the only way we can stop facilities that are being proposed in the United States that are going to use captive bred dolphins because the laws are not strong enough to do it. And I tell you, it can work. One of the reasons the Arizona project got as far along as it did was because we didn't know about it. They were very smart and they did it all very stealthily. But in other places where they've been more public about it, public protest has stopped it. It's, they stopped it in Denver. They stopped it in a couple of other places where it was proposed. We haven't had very many new facilities be built in the United States. Because quite frankly, the market isn't there. And that's what we need to keep impressing partners and sponsors and so on with. I have some hope that we might actually end up closing the Georgia Aquarium. And it's only 10 years old. <laughs> the film Born to be Free is going to be very damning for them. They're going to have a very hard time literally surviving that. Now, we need to get it to the United States, of course, but we're working on that. Niall? Betsy. Laundering still happens, as we know. Um, it happened with Morgan. That's how she ended up at Loro Park. It was laundering. Laundering still happens, um, and it, especially when they send the whales to a facility and then breed captive bred, you know, captive progeny. Those progeny are then pretty much rubber stamped in trade. It's very difficult to stop captive born progeny in trade. All of the laws are designed to protect wild caught animals. They're not welfare statutes. They're conservation statutes. And so um, the funny thing about marine land, and you'll see it, um, I'm just going to announce right now, I've, I've written a rebuttal to Georgia Aquarium's outrageous BS in, to justify what it did with those 18 belugas from Russia. They produced a 50-page document called the Beluga Import Project, which is a 50-page screed to apologize. It's an apologist screed. It's not to apologize. It's to say we have nothing to apologize for. Um, 
for that project, and I, I've rebutted it, and it's now up on the AWI website, so if you go to my community page, you'll, you'll find that rebuttal. And one of the things about that is, why didn't they go to Marineland of Ontario? Why did they have to go all the way to Russia and bring in these wild-caught animals? Well, they did. They don't say that in the 50-page in the screed. They, do not, they don't mention Marineland at all. Because they did go to Marineland, and John Holder told them to, where they could stick it. And the reason he told them that was because, this is, this is the kind of stuff that goes on. It's just so stupid, you know? The reason they told them that was because George Aquarium was working with SeaWorld. SeaWorld sent a kaika to Marine Land, then they went back and got him because they didn't like the fact that August Bush made a deal with John Holder to take a kaika. That was all a gentleman's friend's old boys network agreement, and the trainers and the caretakers actually didn't want it to happen. So kaika goes to Marine Land, is miserable there, and as soon as Anheuser-Busch goes belly up and SeaWorld becomes a publicly owned company, they went back to get him. Polar tried to take him to court. Possession is nine tenths of the law. He lost. They write these airtight contracts. And they had to go in the dead of night with a sheriff's escort to get a Geica. Polar hates SeaWorld's guts now. And he's never going to give him any of his belugas again. He gave him three captive born belugas back in 2006. That's never going to happen again. George Aquarium was working with SeaWorld. He, he slammed the door in their face. How stupid is all that? <laughs> Four of them are dead. We now know that. And in fact, you'll see that in the 50-page screed. They admit it. Bury. They bury it. They bury the lead. <laughs> but they, four of them have died. And they do not take any accountability for that, which is the worst part of this 50-page document. Um, the other 14 are unknown because they stopped supporting them. Georgia Aquarium stopped supporting them in April this year with no explanation. So, as of April, we do not know where they are. My guess is that Lev Muhammadov, who is the guy who owns Nutrish Marine Station, which is where they've been held all this time, will sell them to China as soon as he can if he hasn't done it already. Um, in this other report, uh, two days ago, six uh, belugas were transferred to China. So, as of two days ago, Oksana is saying that those belugas were transferred to China. We're not sure if it's those belugas, but we know that... Six Some belugas were transferred to China. to China. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, if in fact they're all still alive, we know four died, but maybe more did, but if they're all still alive, I've always assumed they're going to be sold to China, and I don't see how that's going to be stopped. Um, you're Gryffindor, I'm yeah. Hogwarts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, uh, in fact, uh, we're in discussions with them right now about some things, yeah. In the back, uh, Margo. Establishing guidelines for the animal welfare. It can take a long time, but bear in mind, sorry, can you not hear me? I was just saying I wanted to go back to the question about establishing guidelines for the animal welfare. Yes, it can take a long time, and as Naomi said, you do run the risk that they're then saying to you as the NGO that you're saying these standards are okay. But it could also work in the opposite direction because that's what happened in the UK. When the Klemanska report came out, and they said, these are the guidelines that you have to meet to hold these animals. None of the facilities could afford to meet those requirements, and, and they ended up closing. So it can work out in the opposite direction, so please don't be disheartened that it takes a long time. In certain countries, I think it's an extremely effective way forward, because it would cost too much for them to meet even, even really minimum standards, because they've got none right now. You know, half the countries in Asia have no standards at all. So if they got any standards at all, they probably couldn't meet them, and they would all go out of business tomorrow. So it can be a very effective way of closing facilities. And again, Margo and, and Liz, who are in the back there, their Marine Connection, I'm just going to do a shout out for them. They've been in this business even longer than I have. In 1990, there were, 1989, let's just go a year before that, there were like 30 facilities, 30 dolphinariums in the UK. By 1993, there were zero. Whoa. Absolutely very persistent. They never stopped. They protested and protested and protested and worked and worked and worked and worked and they got those regulations passed. Those are guidelines, in fact, they're not even regulations really. It's not a change in the law, even, okay? So they just got these guidelines passed, but nobody could meet them. And every facility decided to close instead of trying to retrofit. 
every facility. So is anybody monitoring the wild populations of belugas and orcas in the Sea of Okhotsk? Yes, there are researchers who are working on the beluga populations in particular. Um, Russian biologists know virtually nothing about the orcas in the Sea of Okhotsk, but they do know that they're transients. My advice to those folks who now have those orcas is don't swim with them. Um, and they are, um, by definition, the captures of the orcas, there have been roughly 14, 16, Oksana will probably give more background on this, that have been caught in the last three, four years. Um, by definition, that was an unsustainable take because we don't know how many there are, and so you can't come up with a sustainable removal level when you don't have a population estimate to begin with. So by definition, every single one of those takes was unsustainable. With the Russian belugas, we did, they did come up with a population estimate and they did come up with a sustainable removal rate but they added on, they being the researchers and the IUCN, added on a number of caveats to that that Georgia Aquarium couldn't meet. And that's partly why the permit was denied. And in fact, that population is highly likely to meet the depleted definition under the MMPA, which means that they cannot be imported for public display. The MMPA prohibits import for public display when the stock that the animals are coming from is depleted. There's a definition, a very strict definition of depleted. These blues probably meet that um, definition. We filed a petition to have them designated as depleted. The agency just issued a proposed rule agreeing with us that they are depleted. We made public comment, which just closed uh, earlier in July, and they will probably turn around that final rule that designates them as depleted pretty quickly. They do have statutory deadlines for that. The AWA does not have statutory deadlines, but the MMPA does. They will probably meet that deadline, and that stock will no longer, at all, be on the table for the United States. But do you think Russia and China have that, that they're monitoring their stock? Are there NGOs that are monitoring those populations? Yes, yeah, from China and Russia. Like, Again, Oksana can talk about Russia. If, you, if you're asking if there are like, activists who are trying to monitor what's happening, no, like, who, who is there are biologists. Biology there are researchers who are studying the belugas in the Sea of Okhotsk. I said that, yes, and so they are studying them. And that's how come we have all this data that allowed us to say they're depleted. Nobody's studying the, uh, the orcas yet. They're harder, they're harder to study. They're way out in the middle of the Sea of Okhotsk. Well, they are still trying to. They're trying, they're trying to get it. The same researchers, in fact, are trying to get a program up and running on the orcas. Just as of right now, they really don't know how many orcas are in Russia. They say, like, 300 or 10,000, so they just don't know. But you will see it all 